If we think about the study of literature uh, in Japan, but we're not centering standard spoken Japanese, but rather Japanese sign language, then how does how do the stories we tell ourselves change? Um, what kinds of voices that are being ignored suddenly get brought to the center? So in both talking about audio games and also sign language poetry, these are questions that are always on my mind. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. I'm Dan Gable, Technology Manager for the LRC. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Andrew Campana joins us to share his research into audio games, cinepoems, and other boundary-breaking forms of media emanating from Japan. Dr. Campana and the LRC Sam Lupovitz discuss the ways in which media and literature can be reimagined to communicate ideas in new ways to previously overlooked communities. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Sam Lupowitz, Media Development Manager for the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. I'm excited to introduce Andrew Campana. Dr. Campana is Cornell Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow in Asian Studies and is conducting research on the intersection of poetry, gaming, and new media. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. Sure thing. So I thought before we got into talking about your background and how you got into all this, um, one of your articles had uh, an introduction that struck me and I thought maybe I could read it and we could talk a little bit about it and how it relates to your work and how, how it got you to where you are. So Sounds great. Um, it says, the game starts with a black screen, a woman's voice speaking in Japanese, real sound, Kaze no regret. This software brought to you by Warp Incorporated. A string quartet, swelling and romantic, begins to play. Press the start button and the music stops suddenly with the sound of a bell. A light hiss of static. An acoustic guitar picking up the same theme as before is quickly joined by a ticking clock. A deep male voice starts to narrate. Every so often, when you meet someone else, you have a feeling that it's not for the first time. The screen remains black. So... Can you tell us a little bit about what you're describing uh, and what it is I in your work that, that brought you to writing about this and researching this and got you so interested in it in the That's, first place? So thank you so much for reading that. So that was the introduction to my article about audio games, not video games, in Japan, and uh, which are specifically video games meant for blind and low vision players, but for anyone to really enjoy. So games without a video component. Sure. Some of them are like interactive radio plays, but some of them are like Mario or Metroid or things like that, only you just don't see anything. Everything is done by audio cue. So what really drew me to those games is because, uh, as you mentioned, my research is at the intersection between literature, gaming, and sort of digital media technologies mm -hmm. more generally. And I'm interested to see how people take each of those concepts and make it different somehow. So video games, as you can guess by the name, are an extremely visual medium. That's most of what people talk about. They talk about the evolution of computer graphics sure. from 8-bit to, to 3D to virtual reality now. But there's another story we can tell, and that's uh, about, say, games meant for people with non-normative modes of embodiment or sensing, and in this case, blind players in particular. Sure. So this audio game, uh, Kaze no Regret, Real Sound, is a, a fascinating experiment in uh, what a, a video game can be if you aren't so attached to certain ideas of it. Um, the way you play it is uh, totally different than, say, playing Zelda or Final sure. Fantasy or something, because... Often when you play a video game, you turn the sound off, right? It's right. Sort of something while someone else is listening to something or your parents told you to turn it down as a kid. But this game, you can't turn it down, of course. You have to lean in and very carefully listen to everything that happens without any of the usual cues you might expect for interactivity. So, yeah, I found it to be a fascinating example of basically, basically not just a game, but also a literary production, but also something... Uh, that ties together questions of technology and disability that really interest me. 
Sure. Great. Um, and we actually, we had uh, our, our guest last week was uh, Mona Eichelpone from the University of Syracuse, who's also interested in teaching language to people with various disabilities and ways to optimize that. So I th- this is an interesting follow-up for us. Uh, and I'm wondering if it was, uh, was it studying these sort of modes of, of game development and those applications that led you to Asian studies and, and Japanese? Um, was it uh, more an interest in Japanese language and culture that led you to this? Could you comment on that a little bit? That's a great question. So every so often I ask myself this and wonder where it all started. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, definitely in my generation, your generation too, I think growing up, uh, uh, video games were everywhere. And at a certain point, I cued into, wait, all of these games are playing are from one small country halfway across the world. What's yeah. going on here? Uh, so that might have been my initial interest in this thing called Japan. Sure. Um, at the same time, uh, my my uncle, who had fought in the Korean War, lived in Japan in the 1950s. And when I was a kid, he gifted me all of his old language learning textbooks. So oh, okay. So these things happening at the same time probably had a pretty huge impact, I have to say. Sure. Um, and not to mention my dad raising me on samurai films. All of it happening together sure. eventually led me to major in East Asian studies in undergrad. And with uh, an interest I still have, especially in the relationship between technology and culture, which Japan seemed like a pretty interesting case study for. And uh, just because, uh, of course, those things are intertwined everywhere, but Japan is pretty distinct in how it approaches these things. So. So these interests all tied together is what led me to study literature and gaming at the same time. Very cool. What led you to looking at video games as a way to communicate or or uh, to engaging with video games and, and developing video games in a sort of unorthodox way that is more accessible or accessible to, to different groups? Can you talk a little bit about the path that led you to your your interest and and study of that field yeah absolutely so uh so there's the usual stories about game development the usual stories about literature the usual stories about digital media and the internet and how they're told sure but i guess my research is always been about trying to find the stories that are not told the sort of ones that go sideways the yeah. different stories of development um a lot of it was because uh at an early point when I was in grad school, my best friend, who is deaf, took me to a, a sign language poetry slam. And I was I was totally fascinated. And I'm like, this must happen in Japan. Sure. And so then I got sucked into the world of Japanese sign language poetry, especially as shared through YouTube and other video sharing websites. And so it's, again, this intersection between literature, new media, and disability that made me think... Uh, this is something I really need to look deeper into. And so this led to me looking into audio games uh, or for uh, activists with cerebral palsy in the 70s who used uh, modded forms of electric typewriters uh, meant for okay. people with like different types of movement and motor ability to write new kinds of literature. So all of this seemed to come onto my plate right around the same time, so I thought it must be fate, and it should probably be what I work on. <laughs> cool. Uh, some of the the earliest games that I've seen you talk about that take advantage of these different accessibilities, um, there's one in particular you talk about in, in one of your articles um, from the mid-'90s for the Sega Saturn, mm. um, and I wonder if you can give us a little background on that you know, this is still sort of a marginal field, but there's been such a proliferation of of games and what it means to be a gamer over the last ten years with you know smartphones in everyone's pocket. It, it it seems like there aren't the same sort of. It's not just Mario and Zelda and and that sort of thing anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, as every every evolutionary bi- biologist might tell you, there's. No straight path of any kind of evolution. Sure. It's always more like a bush than a tree and endless little tendrils. So yeah. that's uh, been the fun part about going down this rabbit hole. Um, so there are companies like Warp, which made this real sound game that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. We've always tried to push the envelope of what games should look like or what games should do. So that led them to create this sort of idea of the first console game for the blind. But that wasn't the first one nor the last one, even though it was the only major release. There's 
a lot of uh, blind programmers and game developers who uploaded their own games onto the their own personal pages that are still accessible, and these became popular worldwide. You find blind streamers who don't even speak Japanese using on-the-go translation technologies in order to play these games because they're the best audio games there are. Um, but of course, with mobile technology uh, and the iPad, games like Papa Sangre, an audio-only horror game, there are a lot more opportunities and, and uh, to develop and consume different sorts of games that sort of challenge what games look like. Um, at the same time, I'm interested uh, in not just taking the Japanese language as a given in my research, but to sure. see the boundaries of that too. So I was talking about sign language poetry, and so... Uh, Japanese sign language, of course, is a Japanese language that's totally right. different from the Japanese language. So there isn't just one Japanese language. Right. Um, not only that, there are several Japanese sign languages. It's a pretty complicated scenario. So if we think about the study of literature uh, in Japan, but we're not centering standard spoken Japanese, but rather Japanese sign language, then how does how do the stories we tell ourselves change? Um what kinds of voices that are being ignored suddenly get brought to the center. So in both talking about audio games and also sign language poetry, these are questions that are always on my mind. Great. Yeah, that's definitely something here at the Language Center that we talk about a lot and we're very interested in. And, and, and my role in particular is about how, uh, how does technology enable the connection to a culture and in what ways does it, does it limit as well as grant access to uh, immersing yourself in a culture. You followed up nicely. The, the question I was going to ask was about the audio-only games being written and developed in a certain language and, and having to negotiate that then if you're playing a, a more traditional role-playing video game, a localization team would change a lot of dialogue, but not necessarily the visuals. But when the content is all language based, does it present an additional challenge or th are there other opportunities there when you talk about using, you know, mobile translation software and uh, and that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, that's a great <laughs> question. And it's a it's a huge challenge, which is why none of these games have been officially translated yet, unlike right. most Japanese games. Uh, but that in and of itself, I think, is a huge opportunity for experimentation like what yeah. would a translation of an interactive japanese radio play game look like you'd have to re-perform it from scratch basically it would be a huge challenge but a really interesting one and that's one of the things that drew me to studying the japanese language in particular sure uh, was the sort of communities that spring up around it the sort of technologies that develop around it anyone who studies japanese can tell you just how many apps there are for studying Japanese. Like sure. Anki is a very, it's a, a flashcard memorization app. And it's now used for like people studying every language on earth, basically. But it started off by basically Japanese learning nerds, which <laughs> right. made everything. Um, not only that, I mean, Japanese pop culture has had such a huge influence uh, on especially uh, the newer generations growing up in the West. Mm -hmm. And so there's this huge inbuilt motivation to learning Japanese that is pretty distinct to it, where people really want to watch anime in the original language, play games in the original language, and so on and so forth. So huge communities spring up around making their own fan translations of games, of manga, fan subtitling, scanlations, which they call when you scan a manga and you put in your own translations, or a uh, or patches of uh, of game files with uh, with English translations that haven't gotten official releases. There's again these huge communities of language learners at this super intense level, and uh, yeah, so that both kept keeps studying Japanese interesting, but also provides an interesting model of like what language learning might look like in uh, not just tied to Japanese culture, but more generally. Very cool. Um, I want to to digress slightly. Um, there, there are two things I want to talk about with you that came up when I was looking up some of the work you've done, some of the background in these sort of games. Um, and one of them is uh, cinepoems, which I thought was was an interesting sort of signpost along the way uh, of developing this sort of audio based game. Um, I'm wondering if you could give a brief background in, in what this art form is and where it came from. 
um, for people who might not have heard of it. But like, I had not heard of it until yesterday. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, as anyone who studies new media will tell you that there's nothing that new about new media. You can find predecessors and progenitors all the way down the timeline. So sure. I started studying digital media, but I thought, you know, let's look back in the past and see what similar forms of these sort of uh, experiments with poetry and language and new media might have existed in the past. So going back to the 1920s, I stumbled across this, you could call it poetic genre, called the cinepoem, mm -hmm. which originally started in France uh, with a few one-off experiments of like uh, poems that were meant to evoke the cinema, uh, which was not a new media at the time, but uh, changing, definitely. But then... Uh, so Japanese poets in the late 1920s in particular started making ton tons and tons, hundreds of cinepoems. There's a, and the usual form that they took was for a script for a silent film that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And especially one that couldn't possibly be filmed, like cameras going inside human bodies or sure. seeing the beginning of the universe, things like that, that you couldn't right. possibly film. So, and... Uh, that's interesting enough, but then I realized the timing of all this becoming a popular genre was in the late 20s when the emergence of the talkie film, the sound film. Uh, and I realized how much anxiety surrounded the emergence of the talkie among filmmakers and audiences. They thought that once you attach sound to film, films were suddenly going to become a lot more boring. Mm -hmm. They thought that they would have to be realistic, they would be less experimental, they're all going to look the same now. So... This sort of prompted these cinepoems poets to make, to say that we're going to make a new kind of film, one that doesn't even need the screen and doesn't need a camera, but we're going to do it completely through our words, completely through poetry. So, uh, media technology is going in a direction we don't like. We're going to remake it differently, and uh, that's what I see happening again and again with poetry and technology throughout the decades. And sort of, uh, and these audio games are sort of like that, you know. Gaming is going in one direction, forever emphasizing better and more realistic graphics. But how about who's getting left out in this sort of development and how are we going to make something different? Fascinating. Um, this is of particular interest to me. I, uh, Unlike a lot of my other colleagues at the Language Center, my background isn't in second language acquisition or pedagogy. I've always had an interest in language, but I'm a media and art guy. That's my background. And also you know, video games have been uh, a uh, fascination of mine for many, many years. And so I'm. it's it's great to get to talk about this sort of thing and how, how these all come together um, and point to the different ways that we can learn language and and culture uh, in the future. I just I think it presents a lot of really interesting opportunities, and uh, so yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing all this with us. Thanks so much. Uh, you have a book coming out called Expanding Verse, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to plug it and let us know uh, what we have to look forward to. Of course, I'm working on a book now called uh, Expanding Verse, and uh, hopefully it'll be out in the next few years. And that's going to be on. Just what I talked about earlier, sort of looking at different periods of Japanese history and the emergence of new media technologies, the film, the tape recorder, television, and the internet in particular, and how at each moment poets use their work to rethink what media could or should be. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited uh, using this postdoc to uh, really get the manuscript done and out there. It's been an amazing opportunity. And uh, Cornell has been a pretty amazing place to be doing this work. I'm so glad to hear it. Well, and uh, I'll uh, eagerly keep an eye out then and wait and see uh, when, when the book comes out. It uh, sounds like a fascinating read. Thanks so much. Um, it's been great having you on Speaking of Language, Andrew. Anything else uh, that you'd like to say or bring up before, uh, before we wrap? Uh, so I just wanted to plug Cornell's Japanese language program. Wonderful. We have some of the best teachers on earth, basically, and uh, you can take Japanese from very beginning stages to the most advanced. And uh, next semester, fall 2019, I'll be teaching Japanese poetry and Japanese film. Uh, if you want to pursue, uh, if you're on campus and you want to pursue your interests in those, uh, I'm really looking forward to developing those courses and uh, to provide a lot of opportunity for those who are learning Japanese as well, to use their newly acquired knowledge in the classroom. 
Andrew, this has been a treat for me. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, for me as well. Thank you for having me. Next week, we will speak with Brenna Fitzgerald and Arbius Laluni about the after-school language and culture program offered by the South and Southeast Asia Outreach Programs. It gives K-12 students from the local area insights into other cultures and languages, which expands their perspective and understanding of difference. Until then, au revoir. The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Sam Lupowitz and Dan Gable. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners and do stay tuned for our next episode.